Good day, everybody. This is Dr. Sanjay Sani, Al Professor Department Chair. So this is going to be a demonstration of the layers of the calf muscles. This is a prone cadaver. This is the left side. I'm standing on the right side. The camera person is also on the left side. So this muscle that we see here, these are the two heads of the gastrocnemius, the medial head and the lateral head. The medial head, as you can see, is larger. It takes origin from above the medial condyle of the femur, and the fibers, they go down, and it merges with the lateral head. The lateral head also takes origin from above the lateral condyle of the femur, and both the fibers, they merge into one aponeurotic sheet, approximately halfway down the back of the calf. And very rapidly, it converges into the strong stout tendon, which is the tendocalcaneus, earlier called the tendo Achilles. And merging with this tendocalcaneus is this other muscle that we see here. This is the soleus. I will talk about the soleus just a little later. The medial head of the gastrocnemius, when it takes origin from here, it is separated by a bursa from the insertion of the semimembranosus, and that is this bursa of the semimembranosus to reduce friction. The medial head of the gastrocnemius is notorious for many clinical correlations. It is larger, therefore, it can undergo muscle spasm and can produce painful calf conditions. The medial head of the gastrocnemius, we can see, is very close to the popliteal artery, and it is one of the causes of what is known as the popliteal artery entrapment syndrome. The medial head of the gastrocnemius can rupture in tennis players and can produce what is known as the tennis leg. So the medial head of the gastrocnemius has got quite a few clinical correlations associated with the calf. Coming to the lateral head, we can see under the lateral head a very small muscle. And I'm going to retract this to show you this muscle here. This muscle takes origin from under the lateral head. It's a small muscle, it looks almost like a mouse. This is called the plantaris muscle. It takes origin from above the lateral condyle and the fibers immediately become a long thin tendon. And we can see, I have picked up the tendon. This is the tendon of the plantaris. And we shall see the tendon more clearly when I reflect this. We can see this is the tendon of the plantaris. It goes from lateral to medial between the gastrocnemius and the soleus and it merges with the tendocalcaneus. This plantaris does not have much functional use, so therefore it is used in clinical practice for tendon grafting. This tendocalcaneus tendon can also rupture in tennis players and can produce what is known as the tennis leg. And in new residents, sometimes they mistake this tendon for a tibial nerve. And that's why facetiously this has also been referred to as the fresh man's nerve, because this is not a nerve at all, this is a tendon. That brings me to the soleus muscle itself. The soleus muscle is also a superficial calf muscle, but it is under the gastrocnemius. The soleus is like a flat fish. Those fish which are lying flat on the ocean floor, they look like this. That's why this is called soleus. The soleus has got an inverted V-shaped origin. It takes origin from the posterior aspect of the fibula. It goes all the way around. And then there is a tendinous arch between the tibia and the fibula through which the vessels pass. That's called the tendinous arch of soleus. And then the soleus continues to get attached on the posterior aspect of the tibia. This is called the soleal line of the tibia. So therefore, this is the inverted V-shaped origin of the soleus. And the soleus fibers, they go and they also merge with the tendocalcaneus. So these three muscles, the two heads of the gastrocnemius and the soleus, together constitute what is known as the triceps surae. Some books include the plantaris, but for practical purposes, plantaris is not included in the triceps surae. So that brings me to how does the gastrocnemius and the soleus differ from each other? Both of them, they are inserted through the tendocalcaneus onto the calcaneus. Therefore, they are powerful plantar flexors of the foot. However, gastrocnemius is a two-joint muscle. It crosses the knee joint and crosses the ankle joint. So therefore, it can also flex the knee. But it cannot do both of these actions simultaneously to the full extent. So therefore, if the knee is flexed to 90 degrees, the gastrocnemius cannot plantar flex. It's only the soleus which flexes. The gastrocnemius is white muscle. It is fast twitch. It is easily fatigable, type 2. Soleus, on the other hand, is red muscle, type 1. Slow twitch, not easily fatigable, postural muscle. So therefore, we say you stroll with your soleus and you run and jump with your gastrocnemius. Now let's come to the tendocalcaneus. Tendocalcaneus is arguably the most powerful tendon in the human body. It is the only powerful tendon which does not have a sinivir sheath. 
Instead, it has got a different layer of tissue, which we have lifted up here. This is called the paratenone. And this is the paratenone, which provides nutrition to this tendon. As it's inserted on the calcaneus, there will be a bursa. That's called the subtendinous bursa, which reduces friction between the tendon and the calcaneus. Rupture of this tendocalcaneus is a very serious condition. And that can lead to almost as bad a condition as cutting of the foot itself. So if there is a rupture of the tendon, it has to be repaired by means of non-absorbable sutures, preferably stainless steel, using what is known as a Z plus T or Z plus T, so as to break the lines of tension. After having described the gastrocnemius and soleus from outside, now we are going to reflect the gastrocnemius and the soleus one by one. So we have made an incision here at the aponeurosis of the gastrocnemius and we are reflecting them one by one. So we are reflecting the lateral head of the gastrocnemius and the medial head of the gastrocnemius. What do we see? When we reflect the medial head of the gastrocnemius, first of all, we see the structure here. This is the bursa of the gastrocnemius and you can see it is communicating with the knee joint. This is located between the condyle of the femur, medial condyle and the medial head of the gastrocnemius. Just to bring you up to speed, we had already mentioned this was the bursa of the semimembranosus, which was between the semimembranosus and the medial head of the gastrocnemius. So this is the second bursa. The next structure which comes to our view is the plantaris muscle. In all its clarity, we can see it is under the lateral head of the gastrocnemius and this is the plantaris tendon. This is the reflected lateral head of the gastrocnemius. We will reflect the plantaris also. This is the posterior aspect of the knee joint. And what do we notice? We notice this shiny white structure here. This is the oblique popliteal ligament, which is an expansion from the insertion of the semimembranosus. This is the semimembranosus, and we can see it is giving this expansion. This, and also we can see that it is giving an expansion which reinforces the posterior capsule of the knee joint. And we also notice that the same semimembranosus is giving an expansion downwards, which is reinforcing the popliteus fascia. So the semimembranosus gives three expansions at its insertion. Number one, oblique popliteal ligament. Number two, the posterior capsule of the knee joint. It reinforces that and it also supplements the popliteus fascia. This is the popliteus muscle. That's the next structure we notice. Then we notice the full course of the popliteal artery and the popliteal vein. And this is the tibial nerve. We can see that these give numerous branches to the gastrocnemius, both the bellies and the soleus. Coming to the soleus itself, we can clearly see its origin here. It is taking origin in an inverted V fashion, as I had mentioned earlier. Let's come to the tendocalcaneus itself. If you look at the fibers of the tendocalcaneus very closely, we will notice that the fibers have twisted by 90 degrees. In other words, the fibers which came from the gastrocnemius, which is superficial, face laterally, and the fibers which came from the soleus, they face medially. The reason for this twisting is to give extra stringiness to the gait. So that's a unique feature of the tendocalcaneus among other features. What we have done here, if you look very closely, we have made a Z-shaped incision. This is just to show you how we repair the tendocalcaneus. If the tendocalcaneus is cut, we do not repair it in a straight line. Instead, we convert it into a Z-shaped cut and then we repair it like this. The purpose of this is to break up the line of tension. If we repair it in a straight line, it will give way. And after that, the paratenone has to be sutured. Now I'm going to reflect the soleus because I've already cut the gastrocnemius. And when we do that, I will draw your attention to at something called the tendinous arch of soleus. You can see my instrument has come here. This is the tendinous arch of soleus. It is a fibrous arch from which the soleus takes origin. It bridges between the fibula laterally and the tibia medially. And then the soleus continues down along the soleal line of the tibia. So this tendinous arch of soleus is again a clinically and functionally an important region. This is the place where the tibial nerve, the popliteal vein, and the popliteal artery, they pass through. And after that, they become known as the tibial artery and the tibial nerve. So while we are looking at this, I will draw your attention to the bifurcation of the popliteal artery here. If you look very closely, we can see this is where it is bifurcating into a posterior tibial and an anterior tibial. We can barely see it. The significance of this region is that this is the place where the popliteal artery can get entrapped. So this is one of the three places where the popliteal artery can get entrapped. 
One place being here, other place being, as I mentioned earlier, under the medial head of the gastrocnemius, and the third place being at the adductor hiatus, where the femoral artery becomes the popliteal artery. So these are the structures that we can see once we reflect all these structures. And after we have reflected, I'm going to show the deep calf muscles. These are the deep calf muscles, which are covered by this layer of fascia here. This is the transverse intermuscular septum, which separates the superficial calf muscles from the deep calf muscles. To continue with the dissection of the back of the leg, we have reflected the soleus, and now we are in the deep posterior compartment of the leg, back of the leg. We have removed the transverse intermuscular septum, which was a thin film separating the superficial compartment from the deep compartment. So what are the structures we see? First of all, we see these neurovascular structures coming from under the tendinous arch of soleus. And my finger is coming here. So what are the neurovascular structures? This is the tibial nerve. This is the posterior tibial artery. And the bluish structures that we see here, these are the venae comitantes of the posterior tibial artery. Now let's come to the muscles. Up here on the back, we have the first muscle here on the medial aspect. This is the flexor digitorum longus. The next muscle, this is the tibialis posterior. And the third muscle is this one here. This is the flexor hallucis longus. But as we go lower down, the relationship will change, which I shall mention just in a little while. Take a look at this neurovascular structure. This is the fibular artery. The fibular artery is a branch of the posterior tibial artery. And the fibular artery, as you can see, it is entering into the fibula. So this gives the nutrient artery to the fibula, and it also gives artery to the lateral malleolus and lateral calcareal branches as it goes lower down. This fibular artery is an important artery from the surgical perspective. When we are using a piece of the fibula for vascularized bone graft, like for example, to replace a bone loss in the tibia, we use this vascular pedicle. And then we take the piece of fibula and we do the vascularized bone graft of the fibula. So that is the purpose of mentioning this fibular artery. Now we shall go right down just before the flexor retinaculum of the ankle and show the relationship of the tendons. Up here, this was the flexor digitorum longus. And the next one immediately lateral to that was the tibialis posterior. But if we trace the tibialis posterior, we find that the tibialis posterior goes under the flexor digitorum longus and it comes anteriorly. So therefore, in the region of the ankle, the relationship becomes different. From anterior to posterior, first we have this tendon here. This is the tibialis posterior. The next one is the flexor digitorum longus. And the last tendon is the flexor hallucis longus. And in between is the neurovascular bundle. So here we have a very interesting mnemonic. Anterior to posterior, we have TOM, which stands for tibialis posterior, DIC, which stands for flexor digitorum longus, bloody, this stands for the posterior tibial artery, nervous tibial nerve, and Harry. Harry stands for flexor hallucis longus. So TOM, DIC, bloody, nervous, Harry. And under this, these structures, they pass under this here, this is the flexor retinaculum of the ankle. And here, the tibial nerve can get entrapped to produce what is known as tarsal tunnel syndrome. So this is the dissection of the deep posterior compartment of the leg. Thank you very much for watching. So is the camera person, Dr. Sanjay Sanya signing out. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comment section below. Have a nice day. Please like and subscribe.